d'éclairage sur les nuits urbaines. Je suis Nick Lucas, je suis euh, professeur en architecture et en urbanisme, mais plus importantement, je suis euh, le directeur intérimaire du Centre de recherche interdisciplinaire en études montréalaises. Et c'est mon plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui. Euh, le, le mission euh, du, euh, du centre est de, de stimuler la recherche en partenariat et euh, en études montréalaises et de développer des activités en partenariat. Uh, I'm very happy to be speaking you, uh, to you all today on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Uh, McGill University and, and the Centre for Interdisciplinary Research on Montreal honors, recognizes and respects these nations as the traditional stewards mm -hmm. of the lands and waters on which we are meeting today virtually. I'm very happy to turn the word over to my colleague and friend, Daniel Weinstock, who will tell us a little bit about the series. So enjoy the seminar. Uh, merci beaucoup, Nick. Uh, merci à tous ceux et celles qui uh, uh, se joignent à nous uh, aujourd'hui. Uh, alors, mon nom est Daniel Weinstock. Je suis titulaire uh, de la chaire Catherine A. Pearson uh, sur la société civile et les politiques uh, publiques. Uh, et c'est un grand honneur pour moi de vous accueillir à ce qui est la quatrième, uh, la quatrième séance d'une série de webinaires que nous avons conçus uh, au début de la pandémie uh, pour uh, uh, inviter donc uh, des chercheurs euh, de, de l'ensemble de partout au pays et au monde euh, à nous aider à réfléchir aux défis euh, qui euh, affrontent euh, les euh, grandes villes euh, en temps de, de, de pandémie. Donc, euh, c'est notre quatrième séance. La première a porté euh, sur euh, les défis de la recherche, les défis à la recherche qui sont euh, posés par euh, le fait de ne plus pouvoir euh, euh, faire de la recherche dans des lieux physiques, mais plutôt d'être devant nos écrans euh, à tout moment. Euh, le second nous a euh, rappelé l'histoire euh, des épidémies et des pandémies qui ont frappé euh, particulièrement euh, Montréal et la manière par laquelle euh, cette pandémie se compare euh, à ces autres euh, euh, crise sanitaire et euh, la dernière séance a, euh, a regardé les, les défis que posent euh, les pandémies, particulièrement dans le contexte de villes nordiques, euh, donc des villes où il fait froid, euh, ce qui euh, nous impose euh, et impose à des populations vulnérables euh, des défis euh, particuliers, en plus de ceux qui sont euh, généralement donc euh, engendrés par euh, la pandémie. So uh, today we are going to be, uh, uh, the, the puns just write themselves, we are going to be trying to shed light on a phenomenon uh, which has really been, uh, I think, one of the distinctive uh, aspects of uh, the pandemic for uh, those of us who live uh, in cities, which has been the transformation, some would say even the obliteration of uh, nightlife. Uh, one of the uh, uh, distinctive characteristics of big cities and of Montreal uh, in particular. Urban nightlife has suffered greatly uh, in the era of social distancing and curfew. Over the past years, many workers, artists, and night owls of many kinds have been forced to go home. We are under um, curfew in Montreal of 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, the excitement of the night has given way to silence. Those who depend on the night for their livelihood are now deprived of their workspace and their audience in some cases, their social and economic marginalization has only worsened. Montreal's now silent nights are more than ever synonymous with apprehension and insecurity. How does the pandemic play out in the transformation of nighttime affects? What are the impacts of the curfew on those who depend on the night for their livelihood? What affects does such a situation generate? These will be uh, some of the questions which will be addressed during this fourth uh, webinar in our series, Rethinking the City in Times of uh, Pandemic. I've had the great uh, pleasure of hosting uh, this series of webinars uh, with uh, my colleague uh, Magda Farney uh, uh, from uh, the Department of History at uh, Université du Québec à Montréal, and I will now pass uh, the uh, virtual baton over to her uh, so that she can introduce our three speakers for today. Great, thank you, Daniel. Uh, construction has just started next door to me, so I hope you can hear me uh, properly. Um, we have three panelists today, three panelists, each of whom will address a different aspect of our main question or problem tonight, um, uh, Nouvel Éclairage sur les Nuits Urbaines. And so I'm going to introduce all three of them now en vrac, uh, one after the other, and then each of them will speak for uh, five to 10 minutes, probably no more than 10 minutes per person. Um, 
the first two panelists will speak in English. Our third panelist will speak in French. All three of them are happy to take questions in either language. Uh, so the first, uh, the first speaker will be Jess Rea. Uh, Jess is currently the Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral researcher in McGill's Department of Art History and Communication Studies. Dr. Rea is also the BMO postdoctoral fellow at the CIR McCriem, responsible for a project called Smartness After Dark, Understanding Nightlife Governance and Urban Intelligence in Montreal. The holder of a PhD and an MA in Communication Studies and a BA in Public Policy, Dr. Rea is a member of the Conseil de Nuit de Montréal 24 sur 24 and a former visiting researcher at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Uh, their research and public interest advocacy is situated at the intersection of law, policy, and media studies. And so Jess Rea will present in English, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, is very happy to take questions in French as well. Dr. Rea will be followed by Dr. Etta Bild. Uh, Etta Bild is a postdoctoral fellow at McGill's School of Information Studies and a soundscape researcher and educator in the Sounds in the City team, uh, working on urban soundscapes in particular and their relationship to the use of public and private spaces. Her interest lies in developing and testing methodologies for documenting the urban auditory experience uh, and finding ways of improving it in practice through international urban design and planning with a strong focus on participatory approaches and knowledge mobilization. Edda completed her PhD at the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Amsterdam in 2019 uh, in the Department of Geography, Urban Planning and International Development. And she is a member of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Music Media and Technology or in Music, Comma, Media and Technology. Uh, and like Jess, Etta will present in English, but is happy to take questions in French. Et uh, notre dernier participant, uh, mais pas le moindre, est Nicolas Cagny. Uh, Nicolas Cagny est professeur au département d'histoire de l'Université Simon Fraser en Colombie-Britannique et membre du groupe d'histoire de Montréal. Ses recherches portent sur l'expérience sensorielle et émotionnelle de l'environnement urbain. Il est l'auteur de deux ouvrages et de plusieurs articles sur les thèmes de l'industrialisation, de la radiodiffusion, de la gouvernance, de l'éclairage et du bruit urbain, euh, ainsi que de la mémoire historique du patrimoine et des méthodologies comparatives et transnationales. Son article intitulé « City Glow, Streetlights, Emotions and Nocturnal Life, 1880s to the 1910s euh, », un article qui a, qui a été publié dans la, euh, dans la Journal of Urban History, s'est vu décerner le prix Arnold Hirsch de la Urban History Association en 2015. Nicolas travaille actuellement sur les transformations sociales et culturelles engendrées par le développement de chemins de fer, des chemins de fer à Montréal euh, entre 1850 et 1950. Et donc Nicolas interviendra en français, mais euh, tout comme les autres participants, euh, sera heureux de répondre à vos questions en, en anglais. Alors, sans plus tarder, euh, je vais céder la parole à Jess Rea. Merci. Okay. Merci. Uh, merci pour l'invitation. And thanks for having me here. That's this. Okay. And so I want to share a few thoughts. Can you say it? No, Perfect. oops. Very good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so so I, will, I will start talking. Um, I'll share a few thoughts with you today from my experience as a researcher and also as member of the Conseil de Nuit de Montréal 24 So there is a little bit, okay, now. So there is a little bit of uh, research findings and also a little bit of advocacy and governance in here. Um, and I will do my best to try to cover this the less boring way possible. So as we know, uh, the closing down of night culture was one of the first and most dramatic effects we had in this pandemic. Uh, we quickly lost many activities that usually take place after dark, from indoor dining to live concerts, nightclubs, cultural festivals, and even our night walks. 
Uh, so this crisis of nightlife became one of the most regularly reported features uh, in the pandemic. Uh, as you could see, since the beginning of the pandemic last year, and we have lots of news articles portraying nightclubs and dancing and culture and also night shifts. And this understanding of nightlife is quite complex and uh, hosting a variety of sectors, activities, people, stakeholders, and uh, in all levels, people start to advocate for their interests, pushing for financial wage, issuing guides for the renovation of venues and arguing for relaxed restrictions on nightlife outside the domestic space. And so we also saw all sorts of experiments trying to reinvent the culture of the night. And um, we had many examples here in Canada and across the world of people, especially in the cultural sector, trying to adapt to the new rules and new uh, issues uh, that became super common with the pandemic. So we have online film festivals, all kinds of home concerts, uh, theater performances on Zoom, drag queen shows on Zoom as well, virtual nightclubs, music platforms, crowd sourcing funds for the artists, and some gain attractions uh, as possibly permanent innovations while others quickly fade. We are yet to see how this is going to be, but um, it requires lots of creativity from many, many stakeholders. And at the same time, we also saw that the nightlife sector um, had to deal with many other issues. Uh, I'm sure everyone heard about all, let's say, legal, illegal, irregular, illicit, nocturnal gatherings and parties all over the place as a form of resistance to the closing of the night and whose secret festivities and events full of predict predictable headlines and moral panic about raves in the UK and even here in Canada, in Rio as well. There's so many headlines uh, portraying this kind of, let's say, illegal gatherings. And then curfew became an everyday word that we are still using here in Quebec. And uh, an uncomfortable experience for many people, uh, some claiming that the night had become a scapegoat for uh, Governments is struggling with the failure of other measures in controlling the virus and uh, several stakeholders complaining about the lack of financial aid or the financial aid not being enough to cover or uh, integrate many small business, especially in the cultural sector. And also this banning of all night movement outside the home, including walking in the streets at night, as we have here now at 8 p.m., was also seen as evidence of uh, a resurgent fear of the night that I'm sure Nicola uh, will cover this after myself. And in this context of uh, trying to balance interests and not let an entire sector die, as many articles portray it, uh, we recently worked on this report that is available for free to download over here, uh, thinking about what mechanisms and tools and experiences of nighttime governance in the times of COVID-19 could be useful for cities around the world. Um, and night is seen as a highly regulated space or territory. So this concept of nightlife governance is relatively new. Uh, even though the regulation existed here in Montreal for at least the 19th century, or even before. So this of activities happening at night. So this concept refers to the idea that the night, just like the day, has to be managed in a strategic way. And so finding interest between many people and many activities from those who want to sleep, but also seeing the night as a space of uh, creativity, community, party, uh, work, and many, many other things. And in, in this study, we will, and I, with the collaboration of uh, Mathieu Grandin and Mohamed Katri Van Katri, we wrote about Montreal, but we also had other cities participating, uh, Helsinki, Tokyo, Vilnius, and Melbourne. And the idea was to look at nightmares and also other governance mechanisms over here. And you can see like, it's a complex fragmented ecosystem to manage the night, we can imagine how many activities and how many interests we need to balance to be able to govern the night properly. And from an international perspective, it's uh, more, let's say more formal uh, nightmares, commissioners, ambassadors, and this kind of 
formal uh, governance bodies. You can see they're mostly located in the global north, but you also have experiences, even though they might not be super well structured uh, in the global south for sure. Uh, and we have many others in Latin America, for example, that existed for a period of time, few years, few months, and uh, were just continued for uh, several, several reasons. So in Montreal was quite came quite late to the night mayor governance infrastructure and like Montreal has like this uh it's known for its vibrant nightlife for many many decades and it's uh one of the top student cities the night here is perceived commonly as quite youthful and creative but it's been behind all the major cities when it came to nighttime policy making coherent mechanisms or strategies for nighttime governance and so in the last decade the city has seen an increase in complaints about nighttime noise and these conflicts when combining with gentrification and a really really complex regulatory framework among other issues um, would force some well established independent music venues, for example, to move, or as we saw a few cases over the last years, like Divan Range and Catacombs, to close their doors permanently. And uh, the pandemic has accelerated a few of this process for sure. So it kind of potentialized issues that were ongoing already. Uh, and as happened in many other cities, the pandemic shut down many places in here. Uh, in March, if we think about it, last March 2020, Quebec decided that bars, restaurants, and nightclubs would be closed, and at least until May. And then in May, we saw some of the deadliest months here of the pandemic here in Quebec. So the city really struggled to keep um, business afloat, including and especially those in the cultural sector. And in the meantime, uh, in the summer, we saw some reopening, some place adapting and shape shifting to try to offer services. But so far, uh, they have not been able to fully reopen. And now we are under curfew and things are quite complicated. And paradoxically, in a very interesting way, Montreal decided to start regulating and creating governance mechanisms last year during the pandemic. So the city we the city appointed the first night and noise commissioner, Commissaire de Bruyne, the Bras de Lanay. And also in around June last year, uh, Mohair Van Culture Van Culture launched the first Conseil de Nuit. And it's divided into strategic areas like health, security, diversity, and inclusion, nocturnal lifestyle, clubs, cultural bars and venues, and festival and events, and has been like working closely to the municipal administration in reports, public consultations, uh, and we had working groups that EDA also was part less uh, in the fall. And some interesting things with the focus groups and the public consultation was to understand how people perceive nightlife here in Montreal. And we talked with lots of different stakeholders, let's say, and from residents to users of informal nights, artists, uh, queer creators, and it's a very nice to hear how the nightlife in Montreal is not only a space of uh, culture and party and fun and leisure, but also a space for work, community and heal, a space of belonging here in the city. So in the pandemic, of course, took this away from many, many communities and they have to create other ways to, to be together. And so Montreal is, uh, and then we can discuss this uh, in the QA, like Montreal is putting together the first, hopefully, nightlife policy. And it's like quite a collaborative, interesting approach and in dialogue with some other stakeholders. And in, in the meantime, we're also trying to gather open data for the night, which is not very common. And it's a need that we truly, truly have here. And I really hope and expect Montreal to be like a very good example for other cities around the world in terms of nightlife governance. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jess. And next we'll hear from Etta Bild. I will share my screen. I hope it will go seamlessly. Go. So my talk will be, um, we, we definitely think that this would be a nice continuation of Jess's wonderful presentation on setting the stage on 
how night the nightlife has transformed in what used to be the vibrant vibrant Montreal. And of course, um, an important aspect of all of that was that of perception and how we uh, relate to our city um, in terms of also of sound and noise and the things that we're usually used to hear in a, in a vibrant city like Montreal. So my presentation will be focused on aspects of listening during the pandemic and trying to understand a little bit um, what has changed in our experience and how things are going to move forward. So in my presentation, um, I'm going to also talk about the fact that, um, you know, this is an experience that is shared between all of us. So I will invite you to reflect with me on your own pandemic experience. Um, so in talking about the senses, like listening or hearing, there's no better ear witness, what we call, than yourself. So in this presentation, I'll actually uh, potentially ask more questions than um, provide answers, simply to invite you to reflect on what you've felt throughout this whole um, crazy year, let's call it as an understatement. Oops. Um, so one of the salient aspects coming up following the lockdown and even though when the restrictions were loosened was the aspect of silence. That's something that came up. There was a lot of um, publications. There was a lot of uh, attention in the media, a lot of conversation on how quiet our city suddenly became, especially following the first lockdown last year uh, when the city is just stopped to a grinding halt and suddenly uh, it felt a little bit like those dystopian movies when there, were, there was no one in the street. And of course, the thing, first thing that people noticed was the silence. The cities became quieted. Um, there were measurements that showed the fact that cities had uh, actually became quieter in terms of, of actual sound measurement uh, levels. And there was also an observable change in the profiles of sounds that could be heard. Uh, for many, um, there was a welcome change. There was a lot of attention to the fact that I can finally hear birds. I can finally hear people on the street if they are passing on the street. Uh, there was a lot of, I can, fear, I can hear less cars. I can hear less the sound of um, industry and the sound of construction, which had also been activities that had been paused during the initial lockdown. But also for a lot of people, this was a very saddening change because um, the quieting of the city also meant the loss of the sounds of life and a sense of isolation, a sense of loneliness. And just as Jess already, uh, Jess already mentioned, um, also in this whole context, nightlife became effectively canceled. That was something that we were used to hearing, especially in, in urban areas, especially in Montreal, became something that was that completely disappeared. And that of course made a lot of people wonder how things are gonna get back to a normal whenever that will happen. Um, we actually spoke with, um, and as part of our studies, we spoke to uh, people who lived here in Montreal, who live in uh, what we call the Cartier Spectacle, the festival district, which is in downtown Montreal, that used to host um, tens of festivals in the summer. Basically the half of the year would be dedicated in an entire neighborhood downtown Montreal only to festivals, to one of the longest jazz festivals in the world, to all sorts of music catering to millions of, of incomers every year. Um, and that was something that again, stopped, just suddenly stopped. And uh, we also have a number of other neighborhoods which are very vibrant and where their entire attraction point is the fact that they're lively. This is why people move here because it's fun because there's a lot of things to do. So we actually decided to talk to um, a number of people in Montreal to see well, how have things changed and how have they changed for themselves. So we, we focused on talking to people who live in the Plateau Borough, which is one of the uh, neighborhoods, which is again, one of those renowned for, uh, for their nightlife, um, as well as those in the Cartier Spectacle in the festival district. And one of the biggest findings that we had was the fact that people have changed their relationship with space and with sound. Um, nowadays, um, we are conditioned to understand that what used to be, what used to be the third spaces, cafes, bars, places we would go to, to be neither at home nor in our workspaces, they no, are no longer there for our use and for our relaxation. We are now conditioned to use our masks. We're now conditioned to go in and out. And that's something that also only happens throughout the day. It's something that at night we don't even have, or in the evening for that matter, we don't even have spaces where we can really go and relax. And in that sense, indoor space also became a very big challenge because now it has been squished with work and other activities. It has become the place where we, where we sleep, where we eat, 
where we uh, work, where we have to relax, everything is now done indoors. And of course, that also led to the fact that we're starting to observe a lot more sounds. Sure, it's cute. We hear the sounds of birds sometimes. Maybe we hear less sounds of, uh, of cars, but we start noticing other things related to our environment, other things related to our, to our home. We start noticing the hum of the refrigerator. We start no noticing the neighbors. We start noticing the fact that the neighbors are very loud following 10 p.m. and they're listening to very weird music or they really like their Netflix binges. And that's something that has also changed the way in which we relate to our spaces of habitation. Um, and sound has been a very important factor in changing these, in, in in framing these new associations we have with the people around us in their activities. And that of course has also changed when it comes to outdoor space. Um, night noise changed altogether. The concept of being indoors in bars uh, at night nowadays has become not that big of a, uh, it might not necessarily be worse when you're thinking about hundreds of people in a city or actually in a neighborhood distributed across balconies. This is something that came up a lot in our um, responses of people who live in what used to be student neighborhoods. I mean, they still are, but they're not as populated as they used to be in the, in the last year. Um, they were used to having students coming back home at night, having fun, having late parties. And now all of a sudden what they hear is everyone on their terrace. And everyone, of course, you cannot regulate how people are um, having fun on their terrace or until when. So the night of the noise, uh, the noise of the night has also changed in profile. It's now has had gone more into one's own private space that it still remains outdoors and still affects the whole um, environment of sound. And of course, there's still a lot of people who go in parks, but until how late can you really do that? So how has we, we really, I also wanted to invite you how to consider and reflect on how your relationship with the sound of outdoor spaces and what sounds around you mean has changed, how that has changed throughout the pandemic. Because a lot of conversations are now on the fact that the environment has changed. Has it really changed? Maybe. Going back to that idea of silence of the pandemic, the fact that there were so many people who were talking about the fact that the cities sound quieter the fact that again industry activity uh, industry construction all of these things had been off so then of course the city seemed quieter um, but on the other hand as soon as the lockdown loosened and as soon as certain types of activities came back as soon as city uh, cars went back on the streets we've actually been doing measurements in down, downtown montreal and we were when we were uh, measuring the physical aspect. So again, this is not a matter of perception. This is just a matter of like physical measurements of sound levels. Um, nowadays, once, well, actually let's say last summer, once work construction work went into full force, people went back in their cars, you know, which, be, which are safe private spaces. Um, and we started hearing industry and all of that, actually the levels averaged throughout the day, that is true. But those levels have actually increased back up to what they used to be before. So actually this, the environment has not really changed in terms of levels. What it has changed is in terms of profiles of activities that are being performed. So this is also, and I'm going to go a little bit activist right now, but this is also a good uh, motivation for us to reconsider this whole relationship that we keep on talking about nightlife, night noise and health because we're really demonstrating with this when we've completely or almost eradicated a, so, uh, a source of annoyance, a source of, so, of noise that no longer exists, the sounds of bars, the sounds of people going out and whatnot, that is actually not a source of, of trouble in terms of physical, physical measurements. The problems are elsewhere and those are the ones that we need to address. So that I think is also an interesting aspect that We'll have to see how that's going to be integrated further on in conversations, just like what Jess was mentioning, uh, how you know this aspect will be integrated in next uh, policies on noise. Um, so what other, when we were talking to people and to see how else the environment has changed for them, um, they, they, people have said that there was, a, there was a soundscape change during lockdown because they noticed a lot more intrusive sounds. There was a lot of people that said at night when there was no one in the street, they started hearing ventilation sounds from all sorts of um, businesses around or all sorts of construction sounds around. Um, and of course, residents who moved to a place like Montreal do miss its liveliness and the fact that night noise is missing altogether and especially now with the curfew 
um, that has really given the impression of being in, for lack of better terms, sort of a dead city, which makes people, which adds, contributes the, to the incredible emotional stress that we've been under for, for the last year. Um, what I wanted to question though is how we have changed. And again, I invite you to reflect on your own experience. If your tolerance to noise and to sounds has changed, do you feel that nowadays we might be more susceptible, that's how you pronounce it, to the word, to the activities of others and to the sounds of others? Because let's think about it. How did it feel for you the first time, I think somewhere in May, I mean, I'm talking about Montreal, but I'm fairly certain this was the same throughout the world. When you first saw groups of people gathering in parks after months of lockdown and hearing people loudly talking to each other and hearing this sound of masses, masses, well, at that point, four people was a mass of people. Are, are the sounds that before were the sounds of life, the sounds of enjoyment, have they now become the sounds of irresponsible behavior? And again, even more so that during the night, when we know that people have nowhere to go, we know that bars are closed, so what are they doing and why are they outside? Have sounds that before were just, oh, well, it's living in the city, people are having fun, have they now become, have, are we associating them with sounds of irresponsible behavior that needs to be controlled? So with curfews and various restrictive policies um, for social gatherings, are these sounds of the nightlife, have they become a reason for distrust and worry for every one of us? And that, of course, leads us to what is next. We, we were just actually talking before, before we started this, uh, this whole talk, we were talking privately about vaccination. And we were talking about, so how are things going to go once everyone is vaccinated? How long will it take us to sort of re, rewire our understanding of what the sounds around us mean and how we're readjusting to this, to a world in which maybe social contact would be again safe or will be again, not a problem. There are quite a few economists that are projecting a, resur uh, a resurgence of the fun economy, um, similar to what some say was what happened in the roaring 20s after uh, the restrictions of, the, of World War I. But so if that goes according to that plan, nightlife will become a thing again. And they're, ex they're expecting things to blow up for lack of a better term. Things are gonna be fun. People are going to be desperate to engage. Think think people are gonna be desperate to have fun. But how will that actually work on the long term? Will will this experience will have will this have taught us anything about how we think of nightlife, how we associated with annoyance, how we associated with problems, how we associated with um, you know rowdy behavior, and nowadays how we're associated with irresponsible behavior? So what I invite, what I want to leave you with um, is the fact that we have to be prepared for confusing times ahead because due to these new associations that we have with various sources around us and the fact that we're simply exhausted from the loneliness. Um, so it will be maybe a slow realization that the sounds of others are a part of our life, but we'll definitely have to see how things are gonna go. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm going to leave you with to just um, consider just simply how would you react uh, after you will be vaccinated and you will be told that, okay, bars are opening, <laughs> what's going to be her next move? Thank you. Thank you, Etta. Uh, before I pass the, uh, the, the microphone on to, on to Nicholas, I just wanted to remind all of you in the audience that you should feel free to start uh, typing your questions and comments into the Q&A box, the question and answer, uh, or if your interface is in French, uh, QR. Um, after uh, Nicolas has given his talk, we'll have a little bit of discussion among the panelists, and then we'd like to open it up to your questions and comments. So if you have burning questions already, please feel free to type them into the Q&A, and we will make sure to get to them before the end of the round table. Alors, sans plus tarder, c'est au tour de Nicolas Cani. OK, merci beaucoup. Euh, bon, bah, moi, j'ai passé du son à la lumière. Voilà. Euh, merci à, à Magda et à, à Daniel euh, du, et toute l'équipe euh, donc du CRIEM pour, euh, pour cette invitation. Pendant que je partage mon écran, voilà, merci. OK, 
Donc, euh, voilà, ben moi, je suis très content d'être avec vous euh, virtuellement à Montréal. Euh, euh, mais je vous retrouve aujourd'hui donc euh, depuis les territoires ancestraux et non cédés des peuples saliches de la côte dans la région de Vancouver, où jusqu'à présent, du moins, euh, on n'a pas été assujetti à des mesures de couvre-feu. Ici, la nuit urbaine reste accessible pour se promener même pour s'asseoir en terrasse, selon certaines restrictions et règlements, évidemment. Et puis, pour certains, pour certains qui, qui peuvent, et certaines qui peuvent encore y exercer un, un métier réglementé ou non. Évidemment, partout dans le monde, ce sont les personnes qui gagnent leur vie la nuit qui ont été parmi les plus, plus durement touchées par les contre-coups économiques de la pandémie. Ceux d'entre nous qui avons le, le privilège de, de pouvoir y, y déambuler après une journée de travail trouve dans le calme qui règne que, que Eda évoquait euh, l'occasion donc de contempler euh, les effets de cette crise et c'est vraiment pour moi bon pour pour ramener à la un peu le, le rapport personnel qu'Eda a soulevé c'est justement lors d'une 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 telle promenade euh, à l'automne ou à l'hiver sans sans but particulier à la fin de, en, en soirée que je, je voulais mettre à, à l'abri d'une pluie battante si typique de, de Vancouver et que j'ai vraiment réfléchi soudainement comme ça, j'ai pris conscience de, de l'intensité de l'éclairage public euh, et privé, même dans un quartier euh, résidentiel euh, aisé, très calme comme, comme le mien. Euh, pour moi, c'était euh, dans ce, dans ce, dans ce milieu-là, voilà, près de, pas loin de chez moi, une, une manifestation flagrante de ce que le géographe Neil Smith appelait les politiques revanchistes de l'urbanisme contemporain, des aménagements favorisant la surveillance et le mouvement, interdisant le refuge, la tranquillité, en particulier la nuit, euh, à ceux, et en particulier à ceux considérés comme indésirables. Donc, ces impératifs qu'on qu voit d'autant plus euh, clairement qu'il ne se passe pas grand-chose autour de nous s'inscrivent évidemment dans, dans une logique de contrôle nocturne qui, qui guide les villes de, depuis la nuit des temps. Et comme l'expliquent euh, plusieurs historiens, euh, la nuit a toujours exercé une fascination euh, pour, euh, pour les citadins. Royaume du rêve et du fantasme, des fantômes et des démons, du chaos et du romantisme, tout devient plus concentré la nuit. Nos sens s'aiguisent, nos émotions sont à fleur de peau, notre curiosité s'agit. Cette fascination est nourrie d'une part de peur, la peur du noir, des ombres, de l'inconnu, du mal qui guette, de la, de la maladie aussi, comme, comme en témoigne cette caricature euh, euh, de Montréal en 1875 et les, et les maladies qui, qui survolent la nuit et on a la mort euh, qui fait ses rondes nocturnes. Et euh, d'autre part, par, euh, donc, donc cette fascination, c'est la peur, mais c'est aussi la, la volonté de dompter cet espace-temps, de le posséder, de le rendre productif d'y trouver un, un frisson de plaisir, euh, comme, comme encore une fois on parlait de vie nocturne. L'éclairage donc devient euh, la clé de ce désir, le, le moyen par lequel la nuit peut être surveillée, sécurisée, ordonnée. Au Moyen-Âge, on barricadait la ville à la tombée du jour et le guet commençait ses rondes munies d'une torche. Dès le XVIe siècle, en Europe, euh, commence l'obligation de suspendre des lanternes aux maisons avant que l'État, en plein devenir, ne s'accapare cette volonté d'étendre son contrôle sur l'espace public nocturne. Ensuite, l'avènement du gaz puis de l'électricité au tournant du XXe siècle font du lampadaire le symbole par excellence de cette modernité urbaine. Partout en Occident, les autorités municipales vantent la sécurité, la mobilité, l'ambiance cosmopolite créée par les nouvelles infrastructures d'éclairage. Se réjouissant de leur contrôle, accru sur l'environnement urbain, tout en adhérant au progrès apparemment inéluctable du capitalisme industriel. Le, le monopole euh, extrêmement rentable exercé par l'éclairage, euh, sur l'éclairage ex exercé par la Montreal Light, Heat and Power dans la première moitié du XXe siècle, en est d'ailleurs un témoignage éloquent. Désormais conquise et nouvellement respectable et sécuritaire, la nuit s'ouvre à la consommation au divertissement, au loisir, voici l'éclairage du parc sommeur de Montréal, 1890. Alors, bien entendu, ce triomphalisme occulte une histoire bien plus complexe, malgré 
les, les plus enthousiastes déclarations, l'éclairage n'a jamais transformé la nuit en jour. Les flaques de lumière avaient beau être reluisantes, elles créent aussi de nouvelles ondes d'ombre qui apparaissent d'autant plus sombres. À Montréal, l'élargissement inégal du réseau d'éclairage au tournant du XXe siècle est une source de tension constante entre la ville, qui se targue du prestige, du luxe de son système, et nombreux citoyens dont l'expérience nocturne ne correspond pas à la sécurité, à la gaieté promise. Ici, on a euh, ben, un exemple dans les, les archives qui déborde de lettres de citoyens exigeant un meilleur éclairage dans leur rue, dénonçant les dangers d'accidents ou de criminalité auxquels ils se sentent confrontés et affirmant leur droit à la lumière en vertu de leur statut social. La classe sociale joue pour beaucoup ici. En effet, l'avènement de l'éclairage censé sécuriser la ville crée de nouvelles peurs lorsque l'éclairage est perçu comme étant défaillant. La colonisation de la nuit par les classes moyennes et supérieures illumine aussi les inégalités d'accès à l'espace public. Si la, nuit est éclair... si la nuit éclairée est synonyme de respectabilité, de bonnes mœurs, la noirceur est d'autant plus associée aux vices, aux dangers, à l'illégalité. Apache, voyou et autres filles de joie reléguées à la pénombre se trouvent d'autant plus marginalisées. Le contexte actuel, et je terminerai là-dessus, de la, de la pandémie accentue l'historicité de notre rapport à la nuit urbaine. Si euh, depuis des siècles, les citadins ont cherché par tous les moyens de s'approprier, d'occuper, de rentabiliser la nuit en fonction des priorités des valeurs de leur époque, le calme qui règne, bien qu'il qu soit relatif, dans la ville nocturne de 2021 souligne la contingence et la fugacité euh, de notre expérience urbaine. La pandémie a créé de nouvelles fascinations, bien de notre temps, de nouvelles peurs, la nuit urbaine étant désormais considéré comme un lieu de haut risque de transmission, à évacuer le plus possible de toute présence humaine. De nouveaux modes de consommation, alors que nous remplissons nos soirées de plats emportés, de divertissements en streaming, mais aussi de nouveaux enchantements, comme en témoigne la mode de photographier la vacuité des lieux habituellement si animés, dont ces très beaux exemples que je vous ai montrés de Montréal et d'ailleurs dans le monde, publiés dans les médias comme Le Devoir et le New York Times. Si euh, l'accès à la nuit urbaine nous échappe euh, aujourd'hui, c'est bien que celle-ci n'a jamais cessé de nous surprendre, de nous procurer une diversité de sensations et d'expériences, de nous rappeler au fond la fragilité de notre impression de maîtriser l'environnement. Merci beaucoup. Super, euh, merci beaucoup Nicolas. Alors, euh, voilà, lorsque Nicolas partagera plus son écran, on sera en mode, en mode galerie. Alors, nous avions pensé peut-être euh, prendre quelques minutes euh, pour euh, parler entre nous, c'est-à-dire Daniel et moi on, 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 je crois, euh, avons, je crois, quelques questions à poser aux panélistes. Et après ça, nous aimerions ouvrir justement aux questions et aux commentaires du public. Je vois que déjà, il y a quelques questions qui commencent à, à apparaître dans, le, dans le, le, la case questions et réponses, Q&A. Um, to start with, I, I'll, I'll throw out a question, and I'm sure Daniel will have some as well. One question for all three of you, and I, I'm trying to find a way to ask this question without sounding um, um, complotist or, 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 or paranoid, but all three of you have talked, all three of you talked about the ways in which night, the night has always fascinated humankind, and the night and nighttime has also been a source of, of various fears and worries and concerns. And so the, the question that I would like to ask you is, do you think that our uh, political authorities, whether it be municipal authorities, provincial authorities, are they in some ways, and I don't want to say taking advantage of the pandemic, but are they using this particular moment in our history to deal uh, with aspects of the night that bothered them anyway, or that, that bothered them before March 2020? Um, we've seen in all kinds of uh, areas of life that the pandemic has exacerbated uh, fault lines and cleavages that existed already. Is this another example of the way in which 
you know, in, in the end, the pandemic and, and the particular situation into which it's plunged all of us is bringing out concerns about the night that were already there and perhaps giving authorities a way to, um, a particular way to manage these, these concerns. It's a very open-ended question. And, and again, I'm not trying to sound a <laughs> complotist, but I realize that it does come across that way. I'd be interested in hearing all of you on that or any of you. can start maybe. Thanks for your question, uh, Magda. Well, I, I, I truly believe it's maybe less about using this as an opportunity, but it kind of exacerbates historical inequalities for sure. And we can just mention the curfew here in Quebec and how it affected the unhoused communities in the first week. Like people in a homeless situation being fined and having to deal with the police. Uh, so that was quite complicated. And I think it's more about a misunderstanding. I cannot say if it's on purpose or not, but uh, really seeing the night as a space that needs to be framed, regulated, controlled in a very specific way, uh, and not as a space that serves so many purposes. It's, as I said, like as a space of work, of uh, enjoyment, or pleasure, of community, um, and many, many marginalized communities inhabit the night. And then we heard this uh, in the focus groups, from, especially from the queer community, on how the night is a space of care because they cannot find this care in formal organizations, institutions, like government bodies. And also uh, from many immigrant communities here in Montreal, how the night, they have to create their own night because they cannot easily navigate other established spaces of culture and leisure in the city. So it's more of a misunderstanding and probably using this as, a, I don't know, an opportunity to not deal because when the government decides not to deal with something this is also politics and it's also policy policy can be proactive or reactive so not dealing with certain issues is also a way of uh like getting your message through so i really wish we could uh see the night as the complex ecosystem and space and territory and time it is If I could uh, build on that, I, I totally agree with Jess on the fact that um, maybe not directly related to um, sound and noise, but for sure um, making this distinction between um, life should happen during the day and then what happens after sunset is basically um, something that has to be regulated and controls because only bad things happen after sundown, a little bit like something that we were probably educated as kids. Um, so that's, it definitely shows a dismissal of nightlife as something that's valid and that exists and that could exist. Um, and I think that's um, I think that's also where the idea of nightlife and night noise that I mentioned in my talk as related to a health issues, health issue that it's a problem, it's an annoyance, it's a source of concern. It's something that needs to be mitigated and controlled and the police needs to be sent. Um, it's just, just as a fun little fact is, uh, for example, in Montreal, um, if people want to file a noise complaint, they can file it on a special to a special hotline uh, throughout the day. But after I think five or 6 p.m., all these noise complaints go through the police. So then it also shows the fact that when it comes to these types of, 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 of aspects, they're automatically considered as an actual infraction, as an, a challenge, as an issue. Um, and I think that then that's in normal times. Nowadays, um, we don't have the data related to what's happening uh, in terms of noise complaints. Um, but I think there definitely is this, um, it, it definitely shows the fact how we've conceptualized night, the night as an, a, a space that is a space where nothing good happens and everything that does happen and is audible or visible needs to be controlled because the good people that sleep at night have to be protected. Uh, so I think there's a um, there's definitely um, almost a hierarchy of activities that can that should happen throughout the night and throughout the day, and I think that definitely the pandemic has shown the fact that um, actually nightlife is part of everyday life, and that um, you know everyone still wants to go out for a drink, everyone still wants to go and meet their friends, everyone still wants to be able to have dinner and meet with others. So. It, it has really emphasized potentially how that we've been a little bit maybe too harsh on, 
on the things that happen. But again, whether we've become more noise sensitive and how that will happen once um, the curfew is out and how people are gonna react if there's someone drunkly screaming in the street at 12, that will also be something to see, whether it's gonna be uh, actually a bigger source of annoyance or just a sigh of relief that life is back. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, I think Magda, your, your question is a really good one that reflects what have been concerns generally day or night about the way in which we've, you know, in, in our democratic societies have come to tolerate and accept uh, all these restrictions on our on our movement and on, and, and our liberties and, on, and on, on the way in which some of these um, uh, reactions from the state have served to further marginalize people, even criminalize uh, uh, people uh, even, even more. And just, you know, speaking from with some, you know, some anecdotes from the West Coast, like certainly here, um, um, he, well, here in British Columbia, you know, for example, restaurants were, were allowed to stay open until with certain conditions uh, up until a couple of weeks ago. Now indoor dining is, 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 is not allowed, but outdoor patios are only with members of your household and all this. But definitely there's a sense in the, in the kind of nighttime industries, this, the restaurant industry, the arts and, and culture industry, and this is not unique to, to, uh, to, 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 to BC, I think it's global, that you know, these, these are the most expendable things we can we can we can create all kinds of, of, of measures and and workarounds and options for and, and big bailouts for for other sectors of the of the economy but for some reason these can be shut down on, on a day's notice and and it's and we're you know it's it's all good we're supposed to just accept that um, I know I you know in, in, in France the, the 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 culture industry was you know livid with with the Macron government over over these policies and um, and so there's a sense so it's maybe less about what's considered um, what what like a complotist uh, attempt to kind of get things done in a sneaky way as it reveals what the priorities of our governments are uh, in any case. Um, you know, so the, the Rio Theatre here in Vancouver, which is a, a, a you know, a, a well-known kind of independent uh, cinema d'auteur kind of place, is, uh, was, was, had converted itself into a, a, a sports bar because they weren't allowed to show movies, but sports bars were able to operate. So they started showing sports on the big screen and saying like, you know, it was kind of ironic, like, okay, well, we can be open to show sports, but not to show a movie. Like, what does this say about, about, about our, our authorities' uh, interest in, in culture. Now, I just finished my comment though with, with maybe a more, a more hopeful note. I mean, where I live in the city of North Vancouver, during the pandemic, they actually allowed and continues to allow uh, the consumption of alcohol in, in certain parks. Now, those of you listening from Montreal are probably laughing at this, but this is huge progress in, 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 on, in Vancouver. And so, so you know, so, there's, so it's created new opportunities. Now you can you know, legally have a beer with your friends uh, in, in the park. Um, uh, only till 9 p.m. I'll, I'll be it, but but it's 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 there's hope <laughs> that, that 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 so maybe new opportunities can arise as well. So maybe uh, before we we move to the uh, questions uh, in the Q and A, uh, I, I'd like to ask all of you um, to perhaps peer into your crystal balls uh, that you that hopefully you have at your uh, right at your fingertips. Um, so one of the things that I'm very interested in, in general, is what the return to a kind of normality is going to look like across a broad range of uh, areas. Um, now, uh, one of the things that we're already being told as we sort of get, some of us have already received, some of us are getting ready to get our vaccinations, and in our minds we think this is the, the door to freedom, we're being told, attention, you know, it's not going to be like before. Uh, the vaccination uh, is going to reduce risk considerably. It's not going to make it disappear. We are uh, uh, every day told about new variants of the virus, variants of concern, as they're called, that uh, uh, may escape the grip of the, of the vaccines, at least partly. And that therefore, uh, although we are obviously looking forward to a time in which the kind of conditions that we have now are going to um, 
uh, be relaxed considerably. They may not go back to before, partly because of restrictions that are going to be imposed uh, by uh, sanitary conditions. But and this is the, the 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 part that I'm most interested in is this the the, the next part, which is we've changed in the course of the uh, you know what will be probably 18 months to two years of a pandemic, which is not a an insignificant amount of time in the life of a of a human being, especially for you know younger people who might be the biggest consumers of nightlife, it's a significant chunk of their lives thus far. There are many things that are productive of noise and 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 uh, you know um, movement in the city that are also premised upon people acting in ways that they may no longer be willing to act in quite so readily. Think of the very cramped spaces in which live music is often. Uh, you know, performed and it's part of the part of the joy of, of sharing music often that we do it in such close proximity uh, to others, uh, you know, in ways that we were blissfully uh, sort of un, unconcerned about except for the, you know, uh, the, the, the extreme germaphobes uh, in the population. So I, I mean, this is a very speculative question and, and I I, I recognize that you know um, we may not have the tools to answer it in any kind of a rigorous scientifically based manner, but I wonder whether, and especially as we think in a policy perspective, and maybe Jess here is, uh, uh, you know, as we think about the reopening, how much of this set of factors should we be, um, uh, you know, taking into account as we uh, think about reopening uh, nightlife? Should we? Uh, you know, uh, sort of go to the fore and sort of start anticipating that perhaps we won't be craving quite as crowded uh, spaces, indoor and outdoor. Think about, you know, I, I project myself into the past to the sort of the big events of the jazz festival that happen two or three times the course of the jazz festival, where up to 200,000 people will crowd into a very confined sort of area uh, in downtown of Montreal, literally breathing down each other's necks um, will there be appetite for this? Uh, and if not, how do we think about the reopening of nightlife uh, in conditions where uh, we may have, uh, we may be um, averse uh, to going back into the circumstances and conditions that characterized our nightlife before? And I'll finish and say, even restaurants, think about those cozy restaurants where you're literally, you know, sort of, um, you know, got your, uh, uh, elbow in the you know soup of the person next door um so uh anyway it's a very open-ended question and i invite all of you to sort of give your um speculative thoughts on where we're headed okay thanks daniel that's a very good question <laughs> um let's see okay i'll try to be hopeful uh to Let's say uh, for policy, in terms of policy, I'm, I'm quite happy with all these articulations and organizations coming together and trying to create solutions for such difficult time. And as I said, I think Montreal is a very good example and I'm, I'm very happy to see the things that are happening here right now and over this last year. I think it was the click that we needed and it's quite funny to think and plan for a nightlife that it's almost no existing at the moment. Um, but I really think cities will have the opportunity to share experience. Like we keep checking what's going on in Europe, for example, for the reopening and other cities in the global south too. Can we share experience, best practices, mistakes and uh, opportunities for collaboration in terms of what is going to work or not. The crowded concerts at Jean Drapeau, I cannot see this happening soon, but I can. I, I wouldn't say it will never happen again. And also, I, I, I think we missed several opportunities last year in the summer when things were quite okay to test a few things like pilot projects, uh, ideas, like consult with the citizens, see what they would like to see. Like we heard a lot of people mention we would like, we would love to have more nightlife uh, in our own neighborhoods, like the Cartier Centre and uh, the other areas of Montreal. So like do this locally, have more options, entertainment, culture, leisure activities. Like maybe you're going to change the size, the dimensions, the locations. But uh, I think it's also an opportunity to rethink our relationship with the city, public space and our community. So I would just, it's quite vague, but I would try to be hopeful that we have like some lessons to learn and share for sure. 
and I will again like to build on that. I feel like we're maintaining the relationship in which we presented, which sort of shows how uh, we think of things. But um, I think, again, building on what Jess said, I, I do think that there was a lot of missed opportunities on learning from people. I think that potentially this has been, I mean, now what policymakers uh, do with it is a different story, but that was a missed opportunity on um, learning from the from bottom up, from the people, from artists, from people who had all sorts of ideas. I've heard of all sorts of situations in which organizers of all sorts of events had a lot of very interesting ideas on how to create alternative, safe ways of doing things. For example, I remember there was a movie festival in Romania somewhere last year that had to be canceled and they had offered these super cool alternatives on how to do them with cars. And it was supposed, it was maintaining the social distancing rules, but they had received like a flat out no, because no, no gathering. So there was also, I think in the beginning, the, 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 regulate, the restrictions were just so, inflexible and so plastic that they were did not allow for any type of experimentation and i'm definitely here with jess on the fact that we missed on a lot of opportunities and on allowing people to develop their own strategies of doing it maybe with guidance from the city or with guidance from from uh, pro local professionals and things like that but this was really an opportunity to create new forms of participatory processes and what better opportunity than nightlife where there's so many creative people and so many artists that have definitely strategies of playing with these with this ways of doing things like i also this summer i had gone to um, a couple of concerts uh, at a festival in Montreal, which name I forgot, I think it was Pop Montreal. Pop Montreal, yeah. Pop Montreal, yeah. I went to a couple of shows and it was very interesting. It was surreal to be in yeah. a room, in a massive room with just, you know, 40 chairs. 40 people. So, yeah. yeah. And then one on the rooftop, yeah. which was the same, was insane. But these are the types of experimentations which I think, given the adequate, an adequate system of support from officials, they can be allowed to to experiment and that could be the basis of a good practice guide rather than constantly looking at policymakers and at people at high levels to be able to anticipate the realities on the on the ground and i think that's that's definitely an, an opportunity to play with more local initiatives and to really encourage communication and if i may i'm also going to directly address one of the questions that i read in the in the in the q a um someone asked um how we're going to um potentially you know uh reframe how people think of nighttime noise and nighttime in general after it was stigmatized and i think in all of this the common topic is what things have what people have been screaming for decades is communication and participation i think this is the only thing that can really address these issues address this new stigma related to nightlife and to night noise uh, address all the challenges that policymakers and whatever people at higher levels are facing is maybe this will lead to more on the ground participatory processes and the, where communication is an important thing where you can tell people okay no one wants to be you know neck and neck <laughs> in a crowded bar but you can still organize such events and you can encourage people to come and attend them and renormalize a form of socializing within certain constraints but it can only be done through communication and through very clear strategies of communication and participation so this is definitely a situation in which maybe this will be the wake up call, just like just said for the nighttime aspect, but also for encouraging more bottom up rather than constantly expecting things to come from the top and they're the ones who have the solutions and create the frameworks for function. Nicholas, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what policy will will look like, but um, if you look at, you know, there's historians have looked at 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 at, at post pandemic moments, uh, and I feel a little bit nervous talking about this with Magda here, who's an actual specialist on the history of, of pandemics. So maybe she'd like to weigh in as well. But I guess the pattern that sort of emerges is is that there's initial reticence after in in the immediate, like in the year or so after the after after a pandemic, followed by uh, desire to really, you know, let the lid blow off and, you know, parties and licentiousness and all this stuff uh, for, for, for a brief moment. Um, and then people forget. I, I, I gather from, from the little bit I've, I've read about this is that um, the, the, the kind of collective memory of pandemic seems to be um, fairly uh, brief 
from, from, from again, just from, from my, and that's why I'd love to maybe get Magda to comment on this. Um, and, and so, you know, and then people do fall back into habits quite, uh, quite willingly and quite rapidly, uh, relatively speaking. So I think that the current, you know, you hear a lot about pandemic fatigue and the current difficulty, um, you know, that, that, public authorities are having and getting people to adhere, adhere to ongoing and, and intensifying restrictions speaks to a desire to to be done with it to you know the number of people that I talked to say I can't wait till we can can be in a restaurant in a room like like there's a there's there's a desire for that and I think it'll feel weird at the beginning or we'll you know everybody will have this kind of oh, oh my god I can't believe you know it feels so strange to be but my sense is that that feeling uh, won't last long, but that's you know that's just an impression. Of course. I, I I should I should mention for people who are in a, in an act of shameless self promotion, uh, I should mention that those are those people who are interested in these issues. My my chair will be hosting another webinar on May six, which will bring together uh, cultural entrepreneurs from here in Montreal, including Dan Seligman, who is the director of uh, Pop Montreal and who did in fact experiment with um, uh, a number of, uh, of weird and wonderful uh, kind of socially distanced uh, uh, events in the midst of the, uh, of the, of the pandemic. Um, I wonder whether we should go to the questions. So uh, actually one observation which is made by Mathieu Grondet when, when uh, uh, Nicholas was mentioning that uh, we Montrealers uh, are laughing at uh, people in North Vancouver, I had a moment of, you know, I thought, isn't it actually illegal technically uh, to drink in parks in Montreal? And Mathieu Grondin confirmed my impression that, in fact, it is. Uh, we are uh, behind you rather than ahead of you in this sense. And one of the things that we might wonder as we think about the future is whether making public spaces in which people can open spaces, which people can more readily uh, distance themselves from one another and also benefit from uh, the, the, the dissipation that the outdoor affords us, whether some of these uh, uh, laws might not be changed. It's legal to smoke a cigarette in a park, I think, but it's not legal to uh, to smoke um, cannabis, uh, even though we've legalized it in Canada for three years now. So um, I have a, a couple of questions that, um, uh, that, that have been asked. The first one by Mathieu Grondin, uh, sur la question du bruit. Uh, un volume de musique de 85 décibels en plein jour avec les bruits de transport et de construction, ce n'est pas le même rapport que 85 décibels dans la nuit silencieuse. Notre rapport au bruit est toujours relatif à l'environnement sonore. Uh, donc il dit, je suis inquiet devant une potentielle montée de l'intolérance au son des autres avec la reprise des activités nocturnes post-pandémiques. Après avoir été stigmatisés, certains diront injustement par la lutte au virus, les activités nocturnes devront-elles en plus affronter une montée de l'intolérance des résidents face au son des autres? I mean, I, I, if I could just add something um, myself to the question, uh, this is something that we were seeing before the pandemic as certain areas in which nightlife was concentrated in Montreal uh, gentrified. Um, there are great pressures on clubs and bars uh, where there's uh, live music, for example, um, to uh, uh, rein in their um, their activities, so that the people who presumably were uh, were were sort of attracted to these neighborhoods because of the sort of nightlifey bohemian uh, aspect of it, all of a sudden say, "Hey, uh, this is all very nice, but can you please shut up as of uh, uh, midnight or one o'clock?" So, is 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 this going to serve as a pretext? for uh, 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 giving more impetus to something that was already kind of anti-noisism that was already there perhaps even before the pandemic? Well, I think that, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and thank you both Mathieu and to you, Daniel, for, for the follow-up. But I, 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 I give, go back to what I'm saying and to what I was saying in terms of, um, I think this is an opportunity for us to reevaluate our relationship with night noise and with nightlife in general. And I think your point is very is very good. Is is this going to be an opportunity for people to uh, start um, mitigating or start limiting those types of activities more or less? But the what our measurements show and what our studies show, in which we talk to people, is that. Um, soundscapes and environments of sound around us are unhealthy without human sounds like human sounds are the ones that are we really associate with life and everything and i also find it very uh you know weird to um we always focus on on the measurements of sounds and we we take as accepted the sounds of construction we take as accepted 
the sounds of cars. And I mean, not to be anti-construction or anti-traffic, but how come those are things that we cannot demand for changes? And, and as we know, that's, those, ones are, those are the ones that are driving the volume up. Those are the ones that are driving that background hum, which is connected to all sorts of long-term health, uh, health aspects. And we keep on focusing on something which we can really connect to a source, which is a person doing something. How come those are the things that we were like, well, it's it's a fait accompli. Well, traffic is not necessarily a fait accompli and having a car revving on your street or honking or whatever is potentially just as disturbing as it is to have a concert. But again, if if maybe we also reevaluate our relationship with the environment and with you know how we accept life to be more vibrant. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I'm also saying that again, there seems to be an hierarchization of which are the things that we can accept and they're part of life. We have to tolerate that. And the other ones are ones that we can we can discourage because I don't like that type of music. So I want that type of music to go. So it's I I don't know how that can happen, but we do know that people, for example, feel a lot more, for example, the people in the Cartier Spectacle who live in downtown Montreal, where there are a lot of festivals, and you would expect a lot of people to be very disturbed by what's happening. And this is, again, pre-pandemic. Uh, but actually, there's quite a lot of people who we would consider elderly, no offense to anyone here who's over 65, uh, if there's no one. Um, but they, they, those people are not disturbed by the sounds of the festivals. They know the festivals are there. They are informed. There is communication. They are told what is going to happen. So that small aspect of information, of making them feel like they're involved in the process, not that they're the subjects or victims to something, actually makes people more understanding. And they're like, OK, well, this is, this is what people do. This is how they have fun. Uh, it's life. So I think that um, that aspect is very underestimated. The fact that you know these type of local bars and cafes, if they engage with their community and they tell them, "Hey, we're going to do this. You can come." They give them small incentives or things like that. This is how you can start normalizing things. But those are things that can be expected to be done at a local level. I know I keep on mentioning it, but not uh, at a central level. But yeah, there, there's a lot of higher level, more abstract conversations on what we tolerate and what is a good sound and what's a bad sound. And also how can we make sure that people get reaccustomed to certain types of activities through communication? I hope I answered your question. I think that Edda, you already answered the second question in the Q&A as well, hey? So we, we've got that taken care of. So maybe while we're waiting for other questions to appear in the q and I could ask a, another yeah. question to the three of you. Um, um, oui, oui, just to, to, it's to add on what Edda said, uh, when also we, we talked to residents, uh, and I know it was a, uh, a small sample, uh, but we heard some interesting phrase, I'll try to say correctly, uh, que Montréal est une ville intolérant bruit, and that's a problem. And then we, when we talk to them, we saw people really want to be part of nightlife. And this that I just said about dialogue, it's very, very important to talk like between small business, larger business and the community, they, the neighborhood, they are there, uh, specifically in the Mayo and people from there talk to us. And also they said like the need for dialogue, maybe creating channels for a dialogue between the city government, citizens and the business. And also they mentioned that the police should not be responsible for the enforcement of um, noise regulation for sure. And other things that is like uh, the agent of change, agent de changement, that if a small music venue is already there and then you build a condo, nearby and then you're bothered by the noise should you just shut down the the, the, the business that was already there without much dialogue so uh, a few recommendations like policy recommendations emerged from these conversations and they are they are all moving towards more dialogue less police interventions in, in, in noise complaints in the local and community organization for sure here in Montreal Uh, now there's a, I see there's a new question in the chat. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question, uh, okay. Magda, and I will read the new question and ask it uh, afterwards. Afterwards, okay. My question is is not so much about noise, although noise enters into it, but it, but it is about the night and the city 
and the night in the city during the pandemic. And I'm wondering, listening to the three of you, whether as a society or as communities, we need to do more, we need to insist more on the fact that the city at night can be a safe place. And in fact, the city at night and public space can be much safer than private space at night. And we've certainly seen, um, I mean, Jess, Jess talked about the fact that, uh, that the nighttime can be a source of comfort and care for queer communities, among others. Uh, people have talked about the impact on sex workers of the curfew and of the, of the sort of the, the banning people from public space at or urban space at night. We've seen in, over the past year in Quebec, but I, I suspect elsewhere as well, uh, a rash of cases of conjugal violence, of domestic violence, of children, you know, being being uh, beaten by their parents, uh, beaten and worse by their parents. And so clearly the idea of sending everyone home and the idea that everyone will be safe in their homes at night um, hasn't been borne out particularly by our experiences of the past year. So is there a way in which, you know, these, these centuries old associations that Nicholas evoked, um, associations between nighttime and fear and nighttime and danger need to be deconstructed and undone and do we need to insist upon the benefits of night, the safety of night for many people who are much safer in public spaces than in their own homes? Uh, I'd like to hear, hear any, any or all of you on that, uh, on that question. Okay, we can try again. Um, well, I grew up in Latin America, so the perception of safety during the day and at night as well, it's quite different from here. Uh, I'll focus more here. And also again, the even with the queer community, we heard, yes, it's a space of care and mutual respect when we have our own, usually do-it-yourself space, underground spaces. And they complain a, a lot about gender-based violence um, in the, let's say, regular and some other spaces and venues here in Montreal, for sure. And even though a few studies say that uh, nightlife here is quite safe for people who identify as women, um, we didn't see this across like all the, the, the gender identity and expression uh, spectrum. And also when we were talking with the black community or some communities of immigrants here, they said not necessary, it's not necessarily safe nightlife and nightclubs and some venues here. So we have to create our own spaces as well. So I think it's really important. And, and Montreal is giving a few, like taking a few steps in recognizing issues of racism and discrimination and how to advance equity and inclusion here in the city. And um, I hope this uh, changes. But yeah, the experience of the night is super uh, variety. It depends a lot on like people and communities, and uh, it, it, and we learned that asking different communities, of course, you receive different answers. Uh, but yes, thanks. Um, I would also like to add that this, what you just mentioned, the the aspect of the associations between night and fear and the night as a place of darkness where only bad things happen leads to this policing of night and anyone who is in public spaces or in shared spaces automatically become potential perpetrators so then when that is your starting point when these places are policed because something when your starting point is that something bad will happen then of course you have this angle that bad things will happen or you will make those things happen people will feel the need to hide they will feel the need to um to just go in other places so the aspect of um i think the conversation should be also in demystifying the night as a place as a moment that is not part of our everyday life like we even say everyday life not every night life so it's we we're conditioned to see the night as a as a moment of as, a, as an entire period of danger that is hyper policed so everything that happens in that time and every person who is present there is a potential perpetrator. So in that approach to things, um, then the hierarchy of racism, of gender-based violence, of uh, any types of forms of identity, then ju that just gets added to it. So those are people that are anyway um, subject to all sorts of systemic forms of racism or other types of violence. So then when you put them in a setting in which that is already hyper-policed, that just triples the chances or quadruples the chances of, of, of people being feeling um, exposed or feeling feeling like they're unsafe. And that would make, in turn, 
well, and then to add to that, there is a hierarchy of the people who also make the night policies. So it's just, it's, I mean, it could be a friend of mine referred to it as a, a sort of a suburban life type of policy where we're just saying, you know, at the end of the day, you go back home to your home or whatever. Um, and this is, it's a white suburban type of policy. So of course, as long as certain groups of people feel safe or they don't feel safe in those places, anyone else who doesn't fit that description will be even more, um, even higher, there will be even higher chances of them to be considered perpetrators. Doing any type of activities, whether they, and then if you add them, like then, then disturbance during the night get, gets a very, very broad understanding of what is disturbing the peace. Like most cities in Quebec have policies where noise is not really addressed directly with certain measurements or something that could be actually enforced. It's just something as, um, as broad as, um, disturbing la paix et la tranquillité. I mean, the measurement of what disturbs the peace and tranquility is then up to the enforcers, which at night is the police. So then if the police has already a bias towards certain groups, you coughing in the street as a black person or as a queer person <laughs> could mean uh, a disturbance to that. So I think there has to be somehow a change in mindset. And I hold optimistic views on whether that will happen. But that I think is the, the highest level of conceptualization where we have to work on, on the change of discourse on what the night is. Magda, do you mind if I just throw up some images to answer your question? Um, is that okay? Uh, we're not seeing it. Okay. Um, okay, Can so because you... Magda's question. Oh, uh, oh there we go, there, there we go. Reminded me of this very interesting uh, ad campaign from the Joe Torres Safe, Safe at Home Foundation in, in New York against uh, domestic violence, and they ran this series of of photos where you see kind of uh, you know abandoned, dodgy looking, dimly lit streets I, I don't know if it shows up for everybody with the the kind of speaker view in the side there but what's very striking is within these contexts there's always one brightly lit window of an mm -hmm. apartment and the tagline for this was you are safer here than here that the idea that domestic space could be actually um more dangerous than uh uh, public space, albeit poorly lit and 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 not well laid out. Um, so I thought, you know, so that was a really striking, I thought, image to uh, that. You know, that, that your question got me thinking uh, about and how in, you know, in the history of of lighting, you always see the association made between lights and safety. On disait au XIXe siècle qu'un bon lampadaire vaut un autre policier sur la rue. It was, a, it was an equivalent. It was, you know, you could save money on policing almost. But of course, if nobody is, 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 is there to, um, you know, there's the kind of Jane Jacobs approach as well, where community, you know, community of eyes, the kind of community, people looking out for, for one another. And we lose that as well with with uh, with with the restrictions that, that are in place um so i think yeah i just want to reiterate that notion that the equivalency of light and safety is is not such a stark black and white question as, as it's sometimes uh made out to be and there's studies done in the uk and in, in the kind of early 2000s where you know they looked at whether criminality went down when more streets like were built and they found that it didn't necessarily so of course i'm not i'm not saying that to say that street lights are useless right we still you know they have they have their their purpose they make us feel safer if anything if nothing else um but uh it it, it is a more complex question i guess than light equals uh safety and, and if the pandemic can get us to think about that and and rethink maybe how uh, how we use light rather than just kind of the massive uh, kind of flood of light now that's that since he has created I mean there's a lot of interesting work being done on you know on light pollution and, and and that kind of thing so we've 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 built cities where we've just kind of flooded which was always the fantasy of of of, of lighting politics right flood the city with as much light as we can we've done that now 
are is that really helping us um are there ways to use light more effectively that will at once make the city more more more, more enjoyable diminish light pollution which has effects on human beings not to mention on ecosystems on urban plants and animals and all the rest of it and 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 actually make them effective from a from a safety point of view so i don't have the answer to that question but if anything you know maybe the the current climate can help us um, at least pose the question alors, je vais peut-être terminer, si j'ai si le, si si le temps, en, en, en évoquant la question euh, qui est posée par euh, Joël Lavoie dans le, dans le chat. Euh, bon, je crois qu'il y a un phénomène dont on a déjà commencé à parler, qui est euh, le fait que euh, dans, les, euh, dans le messaging officiel du gouvernement, euh, la, 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 nuit, la vie nocturne est vue comme étant quelque chose, premièrement, de, de secondaire par rapport à la vraie vie qui se passe au travail et à l'école, comme on le sait tous. Euh, et deuxièmement, que la nuit nocturne euh, est, 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 euh, a, euh, a comme population une, une frange de la population qui est un peu marginale, donc surtout les jeunes, euh, bon, euh, étant moi-même euh, un, un participant très actif à la vie nocturne musicale de Montréal, je sais que, euh, comme le dit Joël Lavoie, la euh, population qui profite de la vie nocturne à Montréal est très diversifiée. Or, nous avons ce discours qui a probablement beaucoup pénétré euh, d'une sorte de stigmatisation euh, des gens qui euh, semblent avoir besoin de la nuit euh, au-delà du travail et, et de, et, et de l'école. Et alors, la question, c'est comment est-ce qu'on va réussir à sortir euh, de cette stigmatisation pour permettre à vivre ensemble urbain une question que je ne peux pas m'empêcher de, de, de poser moi-même en ma propre voix, maintenant pas celle de Joël Lavoie, c'est que ce serait intéressant de voir à travers les provinces canadiennes et peut-être à travers le monde, comment la vie nocturne a été euh, traitée par des gouvernements, premièrement, euh, qui comme le nôtre, ne dépendent absolument pas du vote urbain pour se maintenir au pouvoir, hein, et euh, des gouvernements qui, euh, au contraire, euh, sont basés en partie, comme c'est le cas, je crois, en Colombie-Britannique maintenant, euh, sur un vote urbain. Euh, ce serait une hypothèse intéressante à explorer, euh, de voir si euh, euh, la stigmatisation dont parle Joël Lavoie est rendue plus facile par le fait que euh, le gouvernement actuel euh, ne, ne dépend absolument pas d'un vote urbain pour se maintenir au pouvoir. Alors, je vais peut-être vous donner euh, 30 secondes chacun euh, pour euh, dire peut-être un dernier mot autour de ces thèmes-là avant de, euh, de clore la, la séance. Ouais, bah, euh, oui, effectivement, Daniel, puisque vous évoquez le, la Colombie-Britannique, où, où ce serait une étude peut-être comparative à faire au plan de, des politiques provinciales à travers le, le Canada et peut-être ailleurs dans le monde, mais, euh, mais c'est clair que ça soulève la, la, la question, euh, comme, comme j'évoquais un petit peu plus tôt, des, des priorités euh, des, euh, des autorités publiques. Et effectivement, ici en, en Colombie-Britannique, on a un gouvernement néo-démocrate au pouvoir qui euh, est élu grâce au, au presque c est, c est, c est exclusivement au vote urbain. Ben, euh, et c'est peut-être pour ça que euh, euh, et on a mis un peu plus la pédale douce sur certaines restrictions que, que ça a été le cas, par exemple, euh, au Québec ou, ou en Ontario, alors que euh, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que certains réclament euh, de, 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 de renforcer ces mesures, mais on peut... On, on, Bon, pour le meilleur ou pour le pire, on a, on a, on a un gouvernement ici qui, qui pondère un petit peu. Donc, je pense que, voilà, je n'ai pas vraiment plus à dire là-dessus, sinon que c'est vraiment euh, une, une, une question intéressante par rapport à, euh, à la gouvernance au Canada et les, les trois euh, paliers de, 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 de gouvernement euh, qui, 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 dont on dépend et, et qui, qui façonnent notre vie de, 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 de différentes manières. Est-ce que Jess ou Eda veulent euh, se prononcer sur cette question-là Ce n'est pas, euh, pas nécessaire. Euh, pas exactement, mais je suis préoccupée avec les élections municipales ici et la continuation de la nightlife policy et tous ces efforts. Nous really espérons que nous pouvons continuer à faire ça et tous les efforts done over the last months could not be lost after the elections because this is a problem it's not only here it's not only in Montreal Quebec it's like many places many cities many countries um so yeah I don't know much about like the, this comparison like urban rural uh voters and I can only speak about like this kind of urbanites and how this is affected here 
So in terms of polis, briefly, I, I, I hope we can like keep discussing this and moving things forward in a quite collaborative way in Montreal, for sure. Alors peut-être que le moment est bon pour euh, redonner la parole. Alors je ne sais pas qui est supposé euh, nous, euh, euh, nous, nous dire euh, officiellement au revoir. Euh, Nick, est-ce que tu veux reprendre la parole pour euh, dire bon, au revoir à tout le monde? OK, avec plaisir. Je vous remercie à tous nos, nos invités. C'était fort intéressant et plein de choses à réfléchir sur pour euh, la, les, les journées, les semaines, les mois, les années à venir. Uh, et uh, je veux chaleureusement aussi remercier uh, Mme Farni pour uh, uh, son modération superbe uh, et uh, aussi Daniel pour uh, la présence et la coordination de la série et au plaisir de se voir pour la cinquième uh, édition uh, de cette série qui aura lieu, je, je, je n'ai pas la date en tête, je vais demander à Magda ou à Dani oui. de m'aider oui. avec ça. En fait, ni la date, ni la thématique n'a été fixée. Euh, il y aura effectivement une cinquième, une cinquième et dernière en fait, séance au mois de mai, probablement vers la mi-mai. Alors, euh, c'est ça, surveillez vos, vos, vos babillards euh, réels et, et virtuels et nous annoncerons euh, très bientôt la thématique et euh, les noms des, des participants participantes à cette euh, prochaine et dernière euh, table ronde. Alors, merci à toutes et à tous de votre présence. Merci surtout à nos trois panélistes, oui. Ada, Jess, oui. Nicolas. Vous avez été très, très généreux pour partager vos réflexions, vos connaissances avec nous. Un bel exemple, je pense, d'une table ronde multidisciplinaire avec des perspectives très différentes, mais finalement qui se sont complétées de manière vraiment merveilleuse. Alors, un grand merci à vous toutes et, et tous. Au revoir tout le monde. À bientôt. Bonne semaine. À la prochaine. Merci. Merci beaucoup. C'était super intéressant. Merci. Grand merci. merci.